All right, uh, let's get started. So this week we'll be talking about uh, physiology in diving. Um, and the topics we'll be looking at are decompression sickness and lung overexpansion injuries, uh, which both fall under the term decompression illness and what the treatment is for them. We're gonna look at gas narcosis, uh, some of the things that happen with apnea diving, um, carbon monoxide, oxygen toxicity, some of the things that can happen in our ears specifically, and some of the things that can happen with temperature regulation in the body. Okay. So our first topic today is gonna to be decompression sickness. Um, and as we are breathing, our bodies take the oxygen from the lungs and it delivers it to the body's muscles. Uh, and the body uses oxygen but it doesn't use nitrogen for anything. Uh, so we call it an inert gas. Uh, and as we know from, from last week's physics lecture, nitrogen actually makes up 79% roughly of the air that we are breathing in. Uh, and this gas exchange is gonna occur um, in our lungs at the extremities of our lungs in the alveoli. Okay, and these are these sacs here. Uh, and the exchange between the alveoli and the pulmonary capillaries is where the blood releases carbon dioxide and picks up oxygen. Okay, so this is the point of transfer uh, for our entire body's circulatory system. Now, when we're under pressure, okay, our body is mostly liquid, um, and so it absorbs more nitrogen when we're under pressure. As we can see, our diver down here is picking up more nitrogen. Uh, and when we ascend, we're relieving that pressure that is keeping all that gas in, which results in supersaturation, which was, uh, again, the term we looked at last week. Um, and as long as we're ascending slowly enough, that gas is gonna come out at a slow enough rate, right? Um, if you've got your can of Coke that's all shaken up, if we crack it really, really, really slowly, we don't get that explosion and that mess. That's essentially very basically what's happening uh, in our body. However, if we come up too quickly, it's gonna come rushing out in the form of larger bubbles which can result in decompression sickness, okay? Now, some other things that can make us more likely uh, to, to have complications with decompression sickness are these things here. Uh, and each of these is mostly because it has an effect on our body's circulatory system, okay? Uh, fat might be the exception here. Uh, it's much easier for fat tissue to absorb gases than other tissues in our body. So things like blood or bone, fat really likes to take in gases. So if our body has a higher fat percentage, we might actually be uh, taking more nitrogen in and have more nitrogen left in our body at the end of the dive. Uh, as we age, our circulatory system does slow down, okay? Um, dehydration can result in constriction of our veins and arteries, which is gonna affect uh, the circulation. Uh, injuries and illnesses, okay, an illness could affect the lungs and our on and off gassing there. Uh, if we have injured tissues, if we have scar tissue, that can actually allow for bubbles to get trapped because it's uh, kind of tears and things that, that bubbles can, can attach to more easily than a healthy uh, body. Uh, alcohol before or after diving, uh, that, one, that one may come as a bit of a surprise to some of you, uh, the after diving. Uh, but again, uh, alcohol does affect our body's circulatory system. Uh, carbon dioxide buildup, okay, this can be smoking uh, or if you have a, an improperly filled tank. Uh, cold water, again, cold water constricts uh, a lot of things in our body. Uh, heavy exercise uh, is going to make things move a lot quicker, which can affect the natural processes. And altitude or flying, as we know, um, decompression models are built on the assumption that when we surface, we're surfacing at sea level, and there is one full atmosphere of pressure still on our body, keeping some gas in, okay? If we're surfacing much higher, there's less pressure uh, keeping that gas dissolved in our tissues, uh, so we can actually release gas faster. Okay. Now, with decompression sickness, we have two main types. Uh, type one we call pain-only DCS. Uh, this is your classic joint pain, or it can be uh, cutaneous 
uh, what we might call skin bends, which look like red rashes and patches on the body. Uh, and, and type two is our more dangerous one, though they all both life-threatening and we should treat them as such. Uh, they have the same treatment, in fact. Uh, this is immediately life-threatening because it's starting to affect uh, our lungs, our heart, or our nervous system, uh, which can result in numbness, tingling, and paralysis, uh, weakness, fatigue, nausea, and then you know the very severe sign or symptom is unconsciousness or death. Uh, and if we look here, this picture is uh, an air bubble which is trapped inside a blood vessel. Okay. Um, now this is going to do a couple things. It's going to start blocking the flow of blood, which can result in heart attack or stroke. Um, but it really does a couple more things that are going to really block the flow. So the bubble is actually going to rub and it's going to irritate the inside of the vein, uh, which is going to cause constriction and inflammation. Uh, and it's also going to um, cause the platelets in the blood to start a clotting mechanism. So there's an obstruction, the blood vessels constricting, and clotting starting to occur. So it's kind of a perfect storm when we get a bubble uh, trapped inside a blood vessel. Uh, now we're going to look at lung overexpansion injuries. Lung overexpansion injuries are predominantly due to breath held ascent, usually in an out of air situation. Uh, this is why the Steza skill is so important and it's pushed so much within the open water course. Um, if you are diving with a chest cold, that can cause some things to get trapped that can then expand. Um, we can have mucus obstruction from heavy smoking. So we actually have these issues occurring inside the alveoli because the gas exchange isn't occurring as it should be. Uh, and the fourth one could be blockage of the trachea, which would be extremely rare. Um, but say for example, uh, you chewed through your mouthpiece and it actually swallowed a piece of your, your mouthpiece and it was obstructing your airway, that would obviously, uh, then if you ascended with a blocked airway, uh, cause a lung overexpansion. Okay. Uh, and we have four types of lung overexpansion. Number one uh, to four, they are in order. Arterial gas embolism is the most immediately life-threatening, okay? Uh, and we've got a bit of a diagram here. So an arterial gas embolism is where the expanding air in the lungs that needs somewhere to go uh, has actually burst through the al alveolar sac and has entered the bloodstream right at the source. So we've got a lot of air now going around inside um, inside our blood vessels. Uh, this is similar to decompression sickness. It's just that the mechanism is different, whereas one is exiting the tissues into the bloodstream. Uh, this is coming through the lungs into the bloodstream. Uh, the second most severe is a pneumothorax, uh, which is uh, better known as a collapsed lung. Uh, so what's gonna occur there is when we get that expansion in the lung, the air needs somewhere to go, uh, and it's gonna burst out of the lung and it's not so much like a balloon exploding uh, with the lung, it's more that it's gonna collapse uh, and you're gonna have the lung peeling off from the, the inside of the chest cavity and kind of flopping around like a, like a deflated balloon in there. Um, mediastinal emphysema is similar to the pneumothorax, but instead of collapsing the lung, the air pocket is actually gonna accumulate in the center of your chest. Um, now this is problematic because within that confined space, there's no exit, and it will fit like a rock in the center of your chest and can actually cause symptoms similar to a heart attack. It can disrupt the movement of your heart, uh, which is you know, an obvious, uh, not a good situation in there. And uh, the, least, uh, the least dangerous, though still you know, exceptionally not a good time uh, that we can get from a lung overexpansion is called subcutaneous emphysema. Now with this, you get the air bubbles accumulating under the skin, most commonly up around your collarbone, and maybe even into your voice box. Um, this is why with our list of signs and symptoms for uh, any form of lung over expansion or decompression sickness in general, uh, voice change is, is on that list. Uh, if you have a bubble pressing on your voice box, uh, you can actually end up having a very high pitched voice. Uh, so if your friend comes up from a dive uh, with a very, very Mickey Mouse voice, don't laugh at them too hard. You probably need to be calling emergency medical services. Okay. 
So our next topic is decompression illness. Um, it can often be confusing when we have two very similar terms of decompression illness, decompression sickness. Now, as we can see, decompression sickness falls under decompression illness. Um, the only way I could ever remember which was which is that DCI uh, starts, well, it has an I in it. So the I for includes both decompression sickness, DCS, and your lung overexpansion injuries. Now, the reason we group uh, both of these together uh, is because it doesn't really matter which it is in terms of your first aid and your course of action. Uh, and it's also very hard to tell um, in the immediate situation. There's the similar signs and symptoms, uh, and the treatment's the same. And we'll look at what that consists of. So your first aid, your very basic steps are to give the patient oxygen, keep the patient lying down, and to call EMS, okay? Uh, oxygen's gonna do a few things. And um, as we mentioned, this is an issue due to nitrogen in the body. So if they're breathing 100% oxygen, they can't actually take any more nitrogen into the body. Uh, oxygen is also going to create uh, a different pressure, pressure differential inside the body that can help eliminate nitrogen from the body faster. Uh, we call that nitrogen scrubbing. Uh, and in general, with any medical emergency, oxygen is going to help the body to uh, start the healing process and repair itself. So definitely the best treatment in this scenario. Now, we are not going to fix someone on their own with this treatment. Uh, anyone showing any um, of the signs of decompression sickness or lung overexpansion injuries uh, does need to go seek professional medical attention. Uh, they're gonna need hyperbaric treatment in a recompression chamber, which is a very long slow process involving oxygen and drug therapy. Now, if we are looking at a compare and contrast of decompression sickness and lung overexpansion injuries, um, they are similar in terms of severity, um, but decompression sickness is going to occur generally later, okay? Generally an hour to two hours post-dive is when you're gonna start noticing the symptoms of decompression sickness. Uh, with the lung overexpansion injuries, if someone has a collapsed lung after a breath held descent, you're gonna know immediately. They are gonna hit the surface and they will probably be screaming. Um, there's another term that we do need to know for um, any sort of dive master or instructor exams, and that is silent bubbles. Uh, and these are asymptomatic bubbles that may occur after a dive. Uh, and they are larger than those typically theorized to form after dive, but they're still harmless. Um, so they're kind of in that safety window that we have with all sort of PADI standards where it bigger than we want, but it's still much smaller than anything that could cause us harm. Uh, and the picture you have below here uh, is how you actually detect these silent bubbles. It is with a Doppler echocardiogram, and this is, is what it looks like when you're using one of these machines uh, to have a look at what's going on in someone's bloodstream. Okay. Uh, so we'll look at gas narcosis. Um, many of you might have heard the term nitrogen narcosis before. We are trying to move away from using that term uh, simply because um, it, it can be many different blends of gas that cause this to occur within the body. So it's not just a normal air tank. Uh, nitrox has no effect on whether you're going to be uh, experiencing narcosis. Uh, so we're just going to use the term gas narcosis rather than nitrogen narcosis. Um, what it's going to do is when we're breathing high partial pressures of gases, so uh, typically below about 30 meters, we're going to start to get some narcotic properties. Um, it's going to distort perception, often described as feeling a bit drunk, and it's not necessarily dangerous to us uh, in any sort of physical way. Uh, it doesn't produce lasting effects or anything like that. However, if you are making uh, poor decisions under the influence of narcosis, that is the main risk. Um, and there isn't actually a set um, idea of what specifically causes it, like where in our neural processing we're feeling these effects. Um, there are several theories. 
feel free to research them on your own time. Uh, the prevention is quite easy. Uh, if we just descend to a shallow depth, it's going to go away almost immediately. Um, now, if you are into technical diving and you are diving, you know, significantly deeper than 30 meters, you're probably going to be using a trimix um, for your breathing gases. Uh, and helium in the mix does not actually have narcotic effects. It is one of very, very few gases uh, that don't cause uh, this effect underwater. So that is why it is used uh, for trimix technical diving. All right. So apnea, uh, this is a term we use for holding our breath underwater. So this is your free diving. Uh, and a few things are going to happen during free diving that we need to know about uh, as sort of basics of our dive theory. Um, so bradycardia is a slowing of the heart. And there's a few things that cause it um, and a few things that people do to induce it. Okay. So the first thing we have here is mammalian reflex. So every mammal, when submerged underwater, we actually have receptors in our body that trigger our body to um, conserve blood flow and keep it into our most important organs, uh, such as the heart and brain, uh, which lets us dive for longer. Uh, so if you're ever trying to hold your breath, uh, just lying with your face in the water, you'll be able to hold your breath longer than just sitting in your computer, in front of your computer right now. Uh, another technique is hyperventilation. Um, which can risk uh, a shallow water blackout, which we'll talk about a bit later, uh, but this can also uh, help with the slowing of the heart, which is going to let us dive for longer. Okay. Um, we're going to look at oxygen and uh, carbon dioxide levels in our body and the effects they can have on us, specifically when free diving and in some other situations as well. Uh, so the terms we need to know are, are hyper and hypo, okay? So hyper is a high level, hypo is a low level. Uh, easiest trick for remembering this one, okay? If you think of a small child who's been given way too much sugar, they are high on sugar, they are hyper, okay? They have too much energy, uh, and hypo being the, the antonym to that. Uh, capnia refers to carbon dioxide, and oxia refers to oxygen. Um, so it would seem logical that oxygen in our lungs is going to be the most important gas for our regulation of our breathing, but it's actually uh, the levels of carbon dioxide that are going to cause us the biggest problems. So both hyper, a high level of carbon dioxide, and hypo, a low level of carbon dioxide, can have really negative effects on our body. Okay, so hypercapnia. We have too much carbon dioxide, and this is caused by dead air spaces in our body. Okay, the symptoms are usually just a headache, uh, but in severe cases can result in confusion or even loss of consciousness. Um, sort of most famously with this, uh, you guys seen the sort of Teletubby full face snorkeling masks that are about this big with the big thing off the top. That is a massive dead air space, and there have been a few recorded deaths with those with people who haven't been properly uh, clearing the, the, the dead airspace uh, and are passing out while swimming and, and sometimes drowning. So if we look at the guy on the right here, um, this bit of the body all through the trachea and into the mouth um, is airspace that is not useful to our lungs, right? There's no alveoli there, there's no gas exchange going on there. So when we breathe, that whole section needs to be cleared and new air needs to be brought in. Now, if we're breathing really, really shallowly, um, we're actually kind of not clearing that and refilling it with new air, and we're kind of just recycling within our dead air space and not bringing in enough new oxygen, uh, resulting in too much carbon dioxide in the system. Uh, if we look at this sort of typical snorkel on the left here, we've almost doubled um, the dead air space that this man is having to clear to breathe. Um, now, even just the the second stage of a scuba regulator is additional dead air space, uh, which is why in diving we talk about long, slow, deep breathing uh, so that we're properly clearing and, and getting new air in to account for the uh, increased dead air space. 
Now, hypocapnia would be the opposite, which is where we have too little carbon dioxide. Um, now, if we look at this spinning skull here, which is not creepy at all, um, the highlighted red portion of the brain uh, is known as the hypothalamus. And what it is responsible for uh, is all of our automatic uh, functions in our body. Uh, so anything that is going to occur um, just on its own um, is going to occur in that part of the body. Um, now, when we are doing an apnea dive, uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, if we're hyperventilating before the dive, we are going to increase the oxygen levels in our body. So that would be hyperoxia. And we're going to significantly decrease the carbon dioxide level in our lungs, okay? So that's hypocapnia. Um, if we are diving underwater and we're coming up, sometimes the carbon dioxide level uh, hasn't returned to a point to actually trigger our brain that it's time for another breath, while our oxygen levels have actually depleted to a point that our body doesn't have enough oxygen anymore, okay? This can result in unconsciousness and obviously drowning if we're underwater, okay? So too much oxygen at the start can actually by the end result in not enough carbon dioxide, okay, which does not tell our body that it's time to breathe yet, which would then result in not enough oxygen and uh, a loss of consciousness. All right. So carbon monoxide uh, is a very dangerous gas. Uh, it is uh, the poisoning itself in diving can occur uh, with significant amount of smoking before a dive or if you have an improperly filled tank. Uh, carbon monoxide can be found in things such as car exhaust. Uh, so making sure that you know where your tank is being filled and that it's properly filtered is very, very important before dive. Now, carbon monoxide is odorless, tasteless, and colorless, uh, which means it's very, very hard to detect uh, just breathing normally from a tank. Uh, and carbon monoxide bonds with hemoglobin uh, 140 times more effectively than oxygen. Uh, hemoglobin is the piece that we can see in the middle of this cutaway of a red blood cell. Um, that is where oxygen bonds when it passes from the alveoli into the uh, capillaries. The oxygen molecules bond into this hemoglobin that transports around the body. Now, if oxygen is being blocked by carbon monoxide, which is bonding more efficiently, uh, you're not going to get the oxygen circulating around your body, which you need uh, for survival. The symptoms of this would include headache, confusion, narrow vision, cherry red lips, or nail beds. Uh, this cherry red is a bit of a buzzword that you'll find uh, in future exams you may take. So if you see that cherry red uh, in a question, you know for sure that this is going to either mention carbon monoxide or contaminated air. All right, so with oxygen toxicity, we have two types. And the first one that we're gonna be looking at today is CNS oxygen toxicity. Uh, we spoke a little bit about this last week um, with uh, the physics lecture and CNS stands for central nervous system. Uh, and this is caused by exposure to high partial pressures of oxygen. Uh, within the recreational limits of scuba diving, we're not going to be approaching these levels with a standard air tank. However, if we are doing uh, nitrox dives, this is what we need to calculate when we're calculating the maximum operating depth of a blend. Um, what can occur with this is if we have a very high partial pressure of oxygen, uh, it can trigger convulsion in our bodies underwater, which on the surface would not be incredibly dangerous, but underwater you're almost certain to lose your second stage and, and drown, especially as this is occurring at greater depth. Um, now, there usually aren't any signs or symptoms that precede a convulsion, uh, but there may be sometimes. And we have an acronym which is vented to remember these signs and symptoms. The V is going to be for visual disturbances. Uh, e is for ears ringing. N, nausea. T, twitching irritability, and dizziness, okay? Um, I'm sure all of us, if we were nauseous with our ears ringing and we were dizzy, would be pretty irritable as well. Now, the second type of oxygen toxicity is uh, pulmonary 
toxicity and it's caused by continuous exposure to uh, elevated uh, oxygen partial pressure uh, in our lungs. So this one is less about the uh, amount and more about the time frame. And signs and symptoms of this include burning in the chest and an irritated cough. It is very unlikely to occur within recreational diving, uh, even with our, our nitrox tanks, which do only go up to 40% with the basic certification. Uh, and this will usually resolve itself just by not diving for several days. Uh, and it's not typically going to be immediately life-threatening. Uh, we're going to look at a few things uh, with that can occur in our ears. And then we're going to look at some temperature regulation in our body. Uh, and that'll be, that'll be it for today. I just need some water. So the middle ear uh, is very sensitive to pressure changes. It is one of the air spaces in our body, uh, similar to our sinuses and our lungs that we are taking underwater. And they're connected by these station tubes, which you can see down here, uh, that lead to the sinuses. So when we are equalizing using our Valsalva maneuver, which we typically do by pinching and blowing, that is gonna create a buildup of pressure, which is then gonna come through the eustachian tubes to equalize our middle ear just here, okay? Um, now, sometimes if this doesn't happen, uh, we can get what we call a barotrauma. So barrow being pressure, trauma being injury. Uh, and this can result in several of these things here, which we're gonna look at a little bit more. So a squeeze, okay, is gonna be when we have the pressure coming in on that middle ear and we're getting sucking feeling, it's a bit of a vacuum, which can result in an eardrum rupture. So if we look at the eardrum here, if it ruptures, we get a small tear, okay, uh, which is obviously uncomfortable, can be quite bad. And if we are diving in cold water and that cold water enters uh, through this rupture, uh, it's actually going to cause a feeling of vertigo in us. Uh, and obviously, disorientation at depth is, is very not good for us. Now, the other thing that can happen is a round window rupture, and uh, it's just gonna start playing now. You'll be able to see what's actually occurring. Okay, so as you guys saw, uh, that's how the round window can, can actually rupture. Uh, and, um, you know, it's almost like a burst disc on, on a cylinder when the pressure becomes too great. That is the point where the pressure is going to release. Um, now, what can also occur is, is a reverse squeeze. And we can see in this diagram with the blue blockage here. So this could be if you're diving with a cold, which is obviously something we're not supposed to do. Uh, so if the eustachian tube is blocked and we have expanding air as we ascend, normally it can get its way out just fine uh, through the eustachian tubes in our sinuses. But if those are blocked, we're going to get an expanding air pocket, okay, which can then cause some of those issues we've looked at with the rupture and the round window, uh, but just going in the opposite direction. Now, a reverse squeeze is not solely something that can occur within the ear. Um, it can also occur in anywhere else in our body where we can get a trapped air pocket. This could be in our digestive system or even under a tooth if we have any sort of filling in there. It should obviously be very uncomfortable. Uh, the last thing we're going to look at today is some temperature issues that can affect our body's physiology. Uh, so the first one is heat exhaustion, uh, where the body works at full capacity to cool down. You're going to get weak rapid breathing, weak rapid pulse, cool, clammy skin, produce sweating, dehydration, and nausea. Um, this is something that's very easy uh, to occur uh, somewhere here like Thailand. Uh, it is currently 
34 degrees in my house. You can probably tell by my face. Um, and it's obviously very important to be hydrated and account for that. Uh, it's also important to know what kind of exposure protection you're wearing to account for both the water temperature and the uh, air temperature. So if we were diving somewhere with very cold water in you know, open ocean, it might be extremely cold and we might need something like a seven mil or even a dry suit. But above the water could be you know, a very, very hot day. It could be 30 degrees plus. So we need to be very careful with you know, making sure we only have the exposure protection on when we're actually about to enter the water and we aren't sitting around in a dry suit or something uh, on a very hot day. Now, if heat exhaustion progresses, it can result in an immediate medical emergency, which is heat stroke. Uh, and this is gonna be exhibited by the pulse is strong and rapid. The person is not perspiring anymore as I currently am. Um, their body is essentially given up. Said, no, I can't do anything else about maintaining the body temperature. Nice knowing you. I hope, uh, hope you had a good life. Uh, the skin's gonna be flushed and hot to the touch. Uh, and it can result in brain damage uh, because the core temperature has just risen to a point that it's almost cooking you uh, from the inside. Just to recap, uh, with a bit of a compare and contrast here with the heat exhaustion and heat stroke, uh, heat stroke is going to be you know above 40 degrees Celsius, which is really hot. Um, and you definitely need to, to cool this person uh, quickly uh, because they can be losing consciousness, uh, brain damage, and, and possibly death. Now, on the other extreme of this, we have hypothermia, which is a difficulty maintaining core body temperature, which is generally about 37 degrees uh, in, in humans. Men are typically a little bit warmer than women with the core temperature, but it's about half a degree different. Uh, and this is going to be shivering and some numbness, right? We've all experienced minor hypothermia before. We've all been cold. Uh, now, if this becomes more severe, they might experience drowsiness. Uh, they might sort of start to hallucinate and almost feel warm. Uh, so similar to heat stroke, their body has just given up. It doesn't know what to do uh, with, uh, with the situation at hand. It can't, it can't regulate it anymore. And some uncoordination may occur as well. Cool. So thank you guys very, very much for listening in this week. We've covered decompression sickness, lung overexpansion injuries, uh, which can be covered with that umbrella term of decompression illness and the treatment for both of them. We've looked at gas narcosis, apnea, and uh, the effects of carbon dioxide within that, uh, carbon monoxide, uh, both types of oxygen toxicity, uh, some issues with our ears and equalizing different barrel traumas, uh, and our temperature regulation issues on both the hot and cold extreme. Uh, so thank you guys very, very much for listening this week. Uh, next week, we're going to be covering, covering equipment, uh, which I'm very excited for. Uh, lots of good stuff there. And as usual, if you have any questions, please, please, please uh, send me an email or find me on Facebook or Instagram. Um, I don't have a lot going on these days, so please give me something to do. I would love to help you guys out. Thank you very much, guys. See you guys next week.